Thank you, Shakara. Thank you for participating in this second lecture of the series, I Live series on Brain Matters. Today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Dwayne Mitchell as our speaker. Dr. Mitchell got his PhD, MD, PhD from Duke University in 2005. Uh, and no, sorry, earlier than that, but then he went on to postgraduate training in pathology and neuro oncology at Duke, and then he was assistant professor. He was um, recruited here to the University of Florida in 2013. He has, where he now he is the Friedman Professor in the Department of Neurosurgery. He serves as director of the Clinical Translational Science Institute of the University, and he's co-director of the Wells Center for Brain Tumor Therapy. Dr. Dr. Mitchell, in collaboration with the with the Preston Wells Center founder, Dr. William Friedman, he has grown one of the largest brain tumor centers in the United States in the translational uh, brain tumor research. He is a leading expert in the development of inno innovative immunotherapy treatments for adults and children with malignant brain tumors. He has pioneered many novel brain tumor immunotherapies that have been translated into first in human clinical trials and multi-center phase two studies. He has received numerous awards. If I read them all, you won't have time to speak today. He has received over $40 million in research funds from the National Institutes of Health for Cancer Research and from the Department of Defense. And interestingly, he holds uh, 25 patents for novel cancer therapies. And he served on numerous national and international advisory boards. So I am, I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell. The title of today's talk is Treating Brain Cancer Using the Immune System. Right? Well, thank you very much for that. Uh kind introduction and also uh, for the invitation to uh, speak with you this afternoon. I know we are all eager to uh, at some point uh, get back to being able to meet in three dimensions, um, but it is uh, also nice to be able to use technology uh, to be able to connect to you uh, from uh, Orlando where I am currently. Um, so I will uh, see, I'll do a screen share. I do have some slides. I'd like to, uh, you know, this afternoon really go through a little bit of an overview of the field of cancer immunotherapy, some of the history of how we've gotten to where we are uh, in our current approaches in treating cancer. Uh, and then I'll spend some time going through the various immunologic approaches that are being tackled um, for refractory cancers, including uh, uh, avenues that we are pursuing here at the University of Florida. And then lastly, I'll wrap up with some uh, thoughts about future directions and where we're headed next uh, in this very exciting field, but rapidly changing field of cancer treatment. So let's see if I can get the slides to show here. Hopefully, are you able to uh, see, the, see the slideshow? Okay, I see some nods, great. Um, so I'll start with, all right, there we go. So a few disclosures. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, I do have some patented technologies that are related to immunotherapeutic treatments. Uh, some have been licensed by pharmaceutical companies and are under evaluation. Uh, they're not the uh, focus of the talk today by any means. This will be much more of a broad and educational overview. But in the discussion of some of the pursuits um, that we are specifically uh, developing here at the University of Florida, there will be some crossover uh, to those technologies. Um, and the other relevant disclosures are shown here in the slide. So as I mentioned, uh, um, let's start with cancer immunotherapy and, and how did we get uh, to where we are currently. I think um, many people, uh, if they've not followed the field, I first got interested in cancer immunotherapy actually in 1992. Uh, I read a book by Steven Rosenberg, who uh, was then and still is the head of the National Cancer Institute Surgical Oncology or Surgery Branch. Uh, he is a surgical oncologist that's uh, been pursuing for many decades immunotherapeutic treatment of cancer, 
And I was really fascinated by the concept of using the immune system to you know, patients own immune system to battle cancers. Um, and over the last really 10 years, uh, the field has garnered significant attention and recognition by the lay public, um, but it has a long history of development as many things in science, uh, where it's really uh, decades and decades of pioneering basic research, as well as clinical and translational research that ultimately leads to breakthroughs um, that people become aware of in terms of making a difference uh, in the field. Uh, the first efforts for cancer immunotherapy really date back over a hundred years. Uh, William Coley has been uh, at times credited as being the father of modern cancer immunotherapy. Uh, he was a surgeon who um, actually heard about patients who had spontaneously recovered uh, from cancer uh, after having uh, an infection in a post-operative setting where the tumor was not able to be removed completely by the surgeon, but then upon infection, uh, the patients seem to resolve and have those cancers disappear. And he hypothesized that it must have been an immunologic response against those infections that then also took hold and would, was effective against cancer. And he began trying to induce this type of immune response and reproduce it in patients by actually purposefully in, uh, uh, initiating an infection in the post-operative setting. Um, this was only moderately successful. There really weren't uh, a reproducible uh, uh, observations of being able to induce these types of uh, remissions, but it began the efforts to really intervene to try to stimulate some kind of immune response, which at that time was not well understood against a patient's own cancer. Uh, it would be almost uh, another 80 years of basic development and understanding uh, cancer models uh, in an experimental setting. Um, and then really some breakthrough discoveries by Ralph Steinman and his uh, colleague Zen Vaclon, who really uh, began to unravel how the immune system actually recognizes both infections and cancers by identifying a key population of cells called dendritic cells uh, that were a trace population of immune cells that actually really were the key to unlocking immunologic responses. These dendritic cells sit in most of our tissues uh, waiting for evidence of either infection or other dangerous stimuli. And they are really the generals of the immune system that tell the immune system what to attack uh, when there's a foreign invader. And importantly, they also help instruct the immune system what to ignore or not to attack self. And these dendritic cells, whether they give stimulatory signals or inhibitory signals to the immune system can often be the, the switch as to whether our uh, immune system attacks or fails to attack a cancer or an invading pathogen. Shortly after the discovery of these pivotal dendritic cells, investigators began to pursue uh, cancer treatment where these dendritic cells were actually used uh, specifically to induce an immune response against patients' cancers. And in 2010, the actual first FDA-approved cancer vaccine, uh, which was a uh, dendritic cell-based vaccine against prostate cancer, uh, actually crossed the milestone of demonstrating uh, effectiveness in randomized phase three clinical trials and became the first active immunotherapy uh, approved for cancer. This treatment um, uh, for uh, prostate uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer actually involves harvesting a patient's own immune cells through something called a pheresis, where you take a large volume of their blood. Uh, those cells were then shipped to a centralized manufacturing facility by the company that developed this vaccine where they would actually isolate or enrich for the dendritic cells that were in the circulation uh, and then expose those dendritic cells to an antigen that's expressed within prostate cancer tumor cells uh, called PAP, or prostate um, assist, uh, assisted uh, prosthetase. Uh, and then they also co-culture them with a, a stimulant called GMCSF, which leads to the activation of these dendritic cells into a more active state where they are ready to prime the immune system against the antigens that they've been exposed to. These then uh, uh, antigen primed uh, dendritic cells are shipped back uh, to where the patients uh, live and are infused at a local infusion center over about a three to four day period. And although this was shown in uh, uh, repeated clinical trials to extend survival by about an, a median survival of four to six months um, uh, compared to standard treatment, it became the first active immunotherapeutic treatment approved uh, for advanced cancers. Since that time, we've uh, so that was really 2010. Since that time, we've seen an absolute explosion of cancer immunotherapy development for a variety of cancers. The biggest breakthroughs really came through 
uh, again, through enhanced basic understanding of how the immune system is actually regulated, where uh, the first drugs um, <clears throat> that were monoclonal antibodies that could actually stimulate an immunologic response against cancer uh, were approved for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. These drugs, uh, which are a little bit difficult to say, <laughs> ipilimumab and <laughs> nivolumab, many have seen the uh, commercials of Opdivo and Urovoy now as they're known by their uh, trade names. Uh, these are monoclonal antibodies that actually block the inhibitory signals that turn off the immune system. And so as part of our normal regulatory mechanisms, we have on and off switches uh, called immune checkpoints that make sure that our immune system uh, responds appropriately, but then doesn't uh, remain in an overstimulated state because that can lead to pathology or, and or doesn't attack our own tissues because that can lead to autoimmunity. These checkpoints, as they're called, uh, one of them CTLA-4, the first identified and the second PD-1, um, are, are oftentimes overstimulated in patients with cancer, meaning that the stop signal is essentially constitutively on. And these drugs essentially block those signals and were shown to be remarkably effective against metastatic melanomas, which up to this point, um, back in, dating back to 2011, really had very little, if any, effective treatments once disease had spread from the local site of tumor uh, initiation. Uh, a few years after the uh, development of uh, and approval of the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we saw the approval of another type of cellular immunotherapy, this uh, 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 coming from a field called adoptive T cell therapy. And this was the use of a patient's own T cells that were now genetically engineered to recognize their cancer as foreign invaders and potently uh, can lead to the elimination of uh, leukemias and lymphomas. These CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor T cells as they are called, uh, showed extraordinary responses in patients who had uh, leukemias that had failed prior, uh, multiple prior regimens and subsequently have also been shown to be remarkably effective against lymphomas uh, that are resistant to standard therapy. And if we now look at since 2010, 2011, which really ushered in the first clinical demonstration of immunotherapeutic treatments that were effective enough to receive FDA approval. This is a list now of the cancers to date in which there are now FDA approved immunotherapies that have come to fruition just really over the last 10 years. And this doesn't count the number of different indications. There may be uh, uh, several of these cancers have three or four different settings where these treatments are approved. And so in total, there are over 50 new FDA approvals for cancer immunotherapies just over the last 10 years. This has been um, by far in the history of uh, cancer development, one of the most remarkable shifts in terms of uh, paradigm shifts in terms of uh, new treatment approaches and one of the most um, proliferative, uh, proliferative in terms of number of new indications in a short period of time each year coming out of the cancer immunotherapy space has been uh, nothing less than stunning to really witness. Also the last on that list, uh, which says M stands for microsatellite instable or uh, mismatch repair deficient cancers. This was actually the first FDA approval uh, given for a treatment, uh, not based on what type of cancer a person has, but rather the genetic profile of those cancers. And so any cancer that has these two types of specific uh, genetic alterations called microsatellite uh, instability or mismatch repair deficiency, um, those patients uh, can be treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors as an immunotherapeutic treatment. And what's interesting about uh, those cancers is these, because these cancers fail to repair their DNA uh, efficiently, or have very unstable genomes, uh, these cancers accumulate large numbers of mutations and large numbers of antigens or foreign proteins that the immune system can recognize. And this became the first time that a drug was approved uh, to treat any cancer with just a specific genetic underlying abnormality, regardless of the tumor type, and also rep represents a real significant um, uh, advance in terms of how we think about cancers from understanding more about their biology and their genetics, um, and that they may have common vulnerabilities or common treatment approaches, even if they are very different cancers, such as melanoma or breast cancer. So if we look at how you target the uh, uh, tumors using the immune system, 
hopefully just in this introduction, you recognize it's been a long evolution of understanding very specific components of how the immune system works in order to develop very specific strategies of how to engage the immune system effectively against cancer. This cancer immunity cycle is a very simplified version of our current understanding of how an immune response gets induced against cancer. And then I'll talk about how immunotherapeutic treatments basically intervene to try to make one or more of these steps that is not occurring effectively in a patient with cancer uh, be catalyzed forward into an effective response. We know that these dendritic cells that I mentioned are the keys to initiating an immune response. And in, for a dendritic cell to initiate an immune response against cancer, it has to pick up antigens or foreign proteins from that cancer cell, something that the immune system can recognize as being different than normal, and also be alerted that this is a disease process that should uh, be recognized by the immune system. So these dendritic cells sit in tissues, and if cancer cells die, and release some of their abnormal proteins that come from mutations or altered growth. Um, and these dendritic cells are signaled that this process is an abnormal process that should lead to the stimulation of an immune response. They will pick up those proteins and then migrate to lymph nodes, uh, uh, undergoing an activation state to alert the immune system that they have found something in the periphery that appears to be abnormal and should be surveyed by the immune response. In the lymph nodes is where these dendritic cells talk to the soldiers of the immune system, the T cells, as well as other cells that are involved in the response. But the predominant uh, effector arm of the immune response are the CD8 or cytotoxic T cells that become activated, expand, and when they have the appropriate programming, they leave those lymph nodes in search of the same source of proteins that the dendritic cells picked up. In this case, the dying tumor cells, uh, in the case of a viral infection, they will be looking for virally infected cells. And if they are um, find in the periphery, the cells that are expressing the same targets that they were uh, initiated against, they uh, elucidated an elaborate molecular program to specifically kill those target cells while rendering normal cells or cells that don't have those targets present uh, uh, relatively unharmed. So this is an extraordinarily precise uh, process, is, which is one of the real powers of the immune system, but it also is a, a very complex process that has a number of steps that require very specific molecular interactions. And therefore, cancer cells have a, can evolve means to uh, halt or evade one or more of these steps. And if you break this cycle, you can lose the ability to survey those, that growing tumor by the immune system. This shows the, some of the just more specificity of how these T cells recognize cancers. And so every cancer cell has, uh, no, it comes from a normal uh, a cell initially that has lost its regulatory programs that control its growth. And so therefore, some of those abnormal proteins or through a process of accumulating mutations, these cancers will express a protein that is different than normal cells. And we refer to that as an antigen, something that can be recognized by the immune system. When a T cell that's been activated uh, against that antigen recognizes it on the surface of the tumor cell, it then leads to the injection of something called perforin, which punches holes in the surface of the target cell, the tumor cell, and then granzymes, which are enzymes that actually will lead to the destruction of that cell, essentially through um, <clears throat> catalytically, enzymatically digesting that cell from the inside out. And so a T cell will puncture the target cell, inject these granzymes, and lead to the apoptotic uh, death of that target cell. When this happens uh, efficiently, it's extraordinarily effective and extraordinarily specific. Um, but as we'll touch on, there are uh, many steps where this process can be halted, and therefore we, can, we do not effectively clear growing tumor cells from the body. This is a, a diagram uh, taken from video microscopy of a T cell that's actually engaging a tumor cell. And it just shows the various steps uh, in, the, in this uh, molecular killing mechanism. The, at the first stage, this T cell is actually surveying the surface of the target to see if it actually expresses the same proteins that it has been stimulated against to recognize uh, as foreign. If that molecular interaction between the antigen and the T cell receptor uh, is productive, then these T cells polarize, these are these um, perforin molecules and granzymes that have been stained in red in these cells. They then shift and polarize uh, those cells 
specifically towards the target that it is in contact with. And then ultimately in this last frame, you can see we'll begin to inject those uh, molecules specifically into that target cell. And so you can envision that if there are normal cells surrounding uh, this whole process, because of the very specific interaction that's required, uh, these T cells have that exquisite ability to kill a single virally infected cell or a single tumor cell, even if it is sitting around uh, completely normal cells in the uh, surrounding. <clears throat> so this is a process that, of course, uh, those of us who are trying to utilize cancer immunotherapy would love to see happen efficiently and in all cases. Um, and the goals of cancer immunotherapy treatment is to try to identify where are the roadblocks to this process occurring and how can we trigger um, or unlock those roadblocks so that the immune system can do what it's really programmed and capable of doing. So there's four major areas currently that are really uh, continue to be under active development for cancer immunotherapy. There are many different strategies to trying to stimulate the immune system. This is not exhaustive, but these are the categories really where we've seen the FDA approved treatments over the last decade really uh, 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 emanate from. And that starts in the area of vaccines, uh, what we call therapeutic cancer vaccines. This is trying to boost the immune response uh, by injecting some kind of active formulation uh, that will get those antigens to the dendritic cells of the immune system, or even loading the dendritic cells themselves with those antigens and giving them back as a cellular vaccine. Uh, this then requires the patient to mount the immune response to that vaccine and lead to uh, elimination of the cancer. Uh, adoptive cell therapy uh, tries to bypass activating the immune system in the patient's body and actually leads to the activation and the expansion of the T cells outside of the patient's body uh, and then returns those activated T cells back to the patient so that they can traffic to the tumor and kill uh, uh, their target. The immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, I mentioned these stop signals. These are drugs designed to block the stop signals or keep the immune system sort of in a always in a go fashion. And they've been remarkably effective uh, against some cancers, many cancers in fact, um, because they allow the body's own immune response to now uh, move forward without uh, receiving those negative uh, inhibitory signals. And the last category to come along, which is a uh, rapidly expanding field, is actually recognizing that since our body really responds quite well against viral infections um, in terms of immune responses, is using viruses to actually target cancer cells and also induce a potent immune response against the cancer cells. And these are called oncolytic viruses, where the viruses replicate, uh, replicate within the tumor cell microenvironment and can kill cell, tumor cells directly as they spread from one cell to the next. And in that process, uh, as the immune system kicks in to recognize the viral infection, can trigger uh, a immune response against the other cancer antigens as well. And in some ways, this is really dates back to what William Coley was attempting to do by trying to purposely infect patients in the post-operative setting to induce an infection. This is now a much more sophisticated and molecularly engineered approach, but is essentially the same concept uh, almost 100 years later, now finally bearing fruit in clinical settings. To go a little more depth and just understanding how some of these uh, new therapies uh, are working, because you'll hear a lot about uh, checkpoint, what are called immune checkpoint inhibitors, or PD-1, PD-L1 blockade. Um, and, and like I said, many of the commercials that are advertising immunotherapies are talking about um, uh, these, these drugs that have really uh, revolutionized treatment of lung cancer, melanoma, and many other cancers. This shows when an activated T cell is encountering a tumor cell. I mentioned to you that T cell receptor will be probing uh, the surface of the tumor cell looking for an antigen. It's actually a molecular complex that's presenting the antigen, but nonetheless, this is the signal that would tell that T cell to kill this target. Well, there are, uh, are negative receptors on the T cell, uh, one of them called PD-1 or program death uh, receptor one. Uh, and this receptor is actually on activated T cells or can become upregulated on T cells. And if the T cell receives a signal through the PD-1 receptor, it's really designed to tell it to not attack this tissue, that it's probably a normal target or something that the body is, uh, uh, does not want an immune response to proceed against. And this has a very positive role in preventing uh, autoimmunity. But in the case of cancer cells, they often upregulate the expression of what's called program death ligand one. It's basically the partner to this receptor. 
And so even though they may be expressing the antigen that the T cell could recognize to kill it, they're also expressing this stop signal. And it signals through that receptor and can turn that T cell off or what was called exhaust that T cell so it no longer is functional. What these drugs um, that have been developed once this pathway was recognized as being an important regulatory pathway, there are now antibodies that either block the ligand so that it can't uh, bind to the receptor or block the receptor so that it can't interact with the ligand. And it essentially breaks that negative inhibitory chain and now allows this antigen specific uh, T cell recognition uh, to proceed without the negative inhibitory signal. And these drugs have been uh, uh, remarkably effective against lung cancers, melanomas, head and neck cancer, renal cell carcinoma. There's a just growing list and list of cancers that are responsive uh, by simply blocking uh, this negative regulatory signal. And so the understanding how the immune system is regulated has really been a breakthrough in uh, uh, opening the door for cancer immunotherapeutic treatments. The other um, approach that has received uh, quite a bit of attention has been something called CAR T cell therapy or chimeric T cell receptors. Uh, these are actually T cells that have been genetically modified uh, so that they can recognize cancer cells much more efficiently than the way our normal T cells recognize a target. So I mentioned to you that, that, it, that for a T cell to recognize a cancer, there has to be an antigen. It actually has to be presented in something uh, that's a molecular complex. It has to interact with the appropriate T cell receptor. All of those events uh, or all of those requirements are very are purposeful because they're very specific, but it also means that it can be uh, relatively easy for the, immune, for the uh, tumor to uh, evolve in a way that it avoids that type of recognition. What chimeric antigen receptor T cells are is these T cells are actually engineered, harvested from a patient, modified in a laboratory, typically using an inactive virus, so that they express a different type of receptor on their surface. And this receptor is very high affinity, so it binds very well. It also has uh, far less stringent uh, recognition requirements and that it can bind to the surface of the tumor cell without requiring the molecular complexes and the complex T cell receptor interactions. And so now any T cell that is modified with this chimeric antigen receptor, as long as you have a target on the tumor that you know you can redirect these T cells against, you can genetically engineer the entire repertoire of the patient's uh, T cell response to be tumor specific. What, essentially, whichever T cells you modify are now redirected to be tumor specific. And so these can be generated in much larger numbers uh, outside the patient's body and then returned in an activated state where they can uh, efficiently traffic and kill those tumor cell targets. And for leukemias and lymphomas, basically cancers of the blood system, these have uh, been remarkably effective with sometimes response rates of greater than 90% of treated patients and even complete response rates in as many as half of the patients with refractory cancers can respond to this type of treatment. And so it's been a breakthrough for leukemias and lymphomas, and people are actively working, including our own uh, group at UF, in uh, generating cells that can be effective against solid tumors using this approach. So who really benefits from um, uh, the immunotherapeutic treatments? As remarkable as they have been, and, and compared to benchmarks for prior cancer treatments, this really has been a renaissance. But it is important to understand that it, uh, not all patients who are treated with immunotherapy really see these types of uh, remarkable responses. And so understanding context is important because as people are considering whether it's the appropriate treatment option for them or understanding uh, what advances still need to be made in the field for this to really be um, uh, relevant for all, all patients, you understand there's still significant work and research that needs to be done. This is a diagram that's uh, oversimplified, but really does graphically represent what uh, the breakthroughs in immunotherapy have really done to the field for patients with metastatic or refractory cancers. So if we look at the average survivals or duration um, of, of cancers collectively, uh, if we, if we um, do not catch or effectively treat tumors at an early stage and they become metastatic or spread beyond their original site of uh, uh, disease initiation, Standard therapies can prolong survival or slow tumor growth, but what we've seen is, is that with standard treatments like chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, uh, we can extend survival, but we usually are um, ineffective 
at being able to provide long-term durable cures or long-term survival for patients with metastatic cancers. What immunotherapy has done has really changed the way this curve looks for patients with metastatic cancers to where we see this population of patients that seem to get significant benefit and durable benefit. You might even argue cures as some of these are uh, more than 10 years out from treatment with no evidence of disease recurrence. Um, if you think of some of the earlier approvals in 2011, you know, we have more than a decade of experience with FDA approved treatments with some of these cancer immunotherapies and see patients with uh, metastatic disease that even 10, 12, 15 years later after treatment uh, have no evidence of recurrence. And so there is a clear change and shift in terms of these, what we call this tail of the survival curve where we have dramatically increased the number or the percentage of people who have a chance for long-term survival with advanced cancer. But we also have to recognize that there is this part of the curve, which are patients who, despite receiving some of these remarkable immunotherapies, are not der uh, deriving that long-term benefit and either having short-lived responses or not responding. And so uh, there's still a tremendous amount of understanding that has to be gained about why that is the case how do we identify which patients are likely to be here and really prioritize them for these treatments versus which patients are more likely to not see that response and perhaps prioritize them for different types of treatment? Or, of course, importantly, how do we make uh, the patients that are in this part of the curve look more like these through better understanding and perhaps better developed therapies? So some of that understanding, um, and this is areas of, of active research, is begin to study, well, what do the patients who respond to these treatments look like compared to patients who don't? And what do their cancers look like compared to patients who don't? And one of the things that we understand is that although patients may have the same diagnosis, so like breast cancer or glioblastoma or melanoma, uh, there are characteristics of their tumors that can uh, influence whether they are likely to respond to an immunotherapeutic treatment or not. One of the um, <laughs> significant understandings is that the mutations that cancers accumulate as they divide and undergo dysregulated growth influences or can influence greatly the ability to be recognized by the immune system. Because if these mutations change the protein sequences and, and create truly novel or truly new proteins that have never been seen by the body before, these are referred to as neoantigens or new antigens. They're as, almost as foreign, if you will, at least in the area where they've mutated as something like a virus or a bacteria would be. It's completely foreign to our hosts. These tend to be uh, the types of changes that the immune system can recognize quite well. And so patients who have tumors that have accumulated lots of mutations or these neoantigens tend to respond much more favorably uh, to cancer immunotherapy. If there's evidence that the immune system has already responded, do they have T cells and other immune cells already infiltrating the tumor at demonstrating that perhaps the body is trying to fight the cancer at some level already? This seems to underlie the characteristics of cancers and again of patients who when we now give some type of boost to the immune system tend to respond better. And then also do they uh, show evidence of markers that uh, are influencing the immune response? So do they express or have high levels of the PD-1 or PD-L1 within their tumors. That tends to be tumors that perhaps are being inhibited by that pathway. And if you now block it with those drugs, you have a better chance or a higher probability of those cancers responding compared to a cancer that doesn't seem to have evidence of PD-1 activation. And so as we understand more about the biology, the molecular profile, the cellular profile, we are starting to gain an understanding to which patients may benefit and from which types of treatment. And you can envision an and I'll touch on this at the end, uh, this is guiding us towards perhaps more personalized or precise approaches to treating patients with immune therapy. The other emphasis, and, and this is a cartoon showing um, what the tumor microenvironment really looks like, it is not just a collection of growing tumor cells, but it is actually a complex mixture of tumor cells as well as uh, cells of the immune system, vasculature, fibroblasts that are all responding to this growing tumor or this injury, if you will, to the body. And so this leads to when we are trying to intervene with a treatment of any type, an interaction between how the tumor cells and the immune cells and the re relative metabolism, the levels of oxygen or hypoxia, all of these factors within the tumor microenvironment can influence whether an immunotherapeutic intervention is likely to be effective or not. And so there's intense study of the tumor microenvironment and trying to understand 
um, for instance, how do uh, our own cells respond when we uh, administer some of these immunotherapeutic treatments? And can that give us insights as to how to develop more effective therapies or recognize when the therapy is not likely uh, going to be effective in a given patient? This is an actual picture, not a cartoon of a uh, tumor microenvironment. This is a breast cancer uh, that's highlighted in light blue, growing actually in a uh, what's called a xenograft model system. So this has been grafted into an animal. This is a multi-photon microscopic image using no fluorescent dyes. It is actually just imaging the cells based on differences in their metabolism, utilization of oxygen, and other metabolites. And it just highlights the molecular and cellular complexity of the tumor microenvironment because you can visualize there are multiple different cell types growing within or interacting within this tumor, uh, in addition to the light blue uh, metastatic, or, or in this case, invasively growing uh, breast cancer cells. And so as we think about trying to treat this with an immune-based uh, treatment, we're gonna have to understand what, what role do these different cell types play in uh, carrying out an effective immune response. So this is leading us towards uh, this current um, understanding. Standard treatments in the past, we could delay tumor growth, but with metastatic disease, we had uh, maybe a, a shift to the right of that curve, but a really an inability to achieve long-term control. Immunotherapy has now given us this population that has a durable benefit, and through increased understanding and now combining treatments in the appropriate fashion, we are working towards continuing to push these survival curves uh, where that tail of so long-term survival benefit continues to increase. And we're seeing that already in comp combining immunotherapies, not just with other immune therapy treatments, but even with standard treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation, that you can now look for ways to make these treatments synergistic so that you get better benefit uh, in, in cancer patients than we've achieved in the past. So the last part, the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about brain tumor immunotherapy and work in our uh, program and how we're trying to apply some of this understanding. So malignant brain tumors are not the most common cancers, but they are one of the most deadly malignancies we deal with. Um, they are associated with profound neurologic uh, impairment because of the sensitivity of the brain and because of the fact that we cannot completely surgically resect many tumors in this uh, uh, central nervous system environment. And we are limited as to how much radiation or chemotherapy a person can tolerate uh, given the sensitivity of the brain. Uh, for advanced brain cancers, uh, we really see this as being one of the most expensive therapies that we deliver for patients with some of the least benefit in terms of uh, prolonged survival. So there's a real need to advance new treatments for malignant brain tumors. Glioblastoma, which is the most common cancer, uh, affects about 12,000, uh, common, common cancer in a brain cancer in adults, affects about 12,000 patients per year in the United States and unfortunately uh, has a median survival of about a year and a half from diagnosis with um, current treatments. And long-term survival is pretty dismal with this diagnosis with almost 90 to 95% of patients succumbing to disease within five years. Some of the challenges we face in trying to develop brain tumor immunotherapy is we need to better understand what are the targets, what are the antigens in brain cancers uh, that the immune system can recognize. We know that they're not expressed at equal levels or in every tumor cell. This is called heterogeneity, and it's something that we have to tackle with not just brain tumors, but with other cancers where we know there's not one target that can get every cell. And so we're gonna have to think of how do you either target multiple different things at the same time or allow the body's own immune response to spread against tumors uh, that you haven't really targeted with your own approach. Uh, we also know that the microenvironment, I mentioned to you those characteristics of tumors that tend to respond against immunotherapy, brain tumors don't show those characteristics. They have low mutations, they don't have a strong evidence of an uh, underlying immune response, and they don't express really high levels of those uh, markers. So they are what we call immunologically cold tumors with immunosuppressive microenvironment. And so all of these factors, along with uh, uh, incomplete understanding of how the central nervous system and the immune system interact, are significant challenges in the field and significant areas of ongoing research. The approach we've taken initially was to use a patient's own dendritic cells loaded with antigens derived from their brain tumors and given back as a cellular vaccine so that those dendritic cells could engage the T cells of the immune system and hopefully induce a strong enough immune response that could uh, traffic to the tumor in the brain and mediate tumor regression. We've been working on these dendritic cell-based vaccines for a number of years. Uh, first clinical trials that I was engaged in in this process, uh, we began in 2006. We've continued to develop these 
and have ne uh, next generation treatment uh, approaches being used here at the University of Florida. We've published uh, quite a bit on the use of dendritic cell vaccines in patients with glioblastoma, and they've shown uh, some significant promise in terms of being able to extend survival when integrated with normal uh, cycles of standard treatment, including chemotherapy. Uh, this is just a survival curve from one of those earlier phase trials showing in a dotted line the survival of patients treated with standard treatment, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and the solid line patients that receive surgery, uh, radiation, and chemotherapy combined with a dendritic cell back vaccine. You can see that, again, not every patient had long-term durable benefits, but we saw this significant improvement in, in median uh, progression-free survival. And then this subset, about a third, that were actually out to five years without any evidence of disease progression. This is quite remarkable for this disease, and that has gone on to a, a large uh, phase two clinical trial that is being uh, directed here at the University of Florida. We've currently enrolled 130 patients, greater than 130 patients, uh, actually 133 patients on this clinical trial, uh, testing this vaccine in combination with standard therapy compared to patients receiving standard therapy alone to try to have a definitive uh, comparative evaluation of whether this vaccine really can extend survival for a significant fraction of patients uh, with glioblastoma. We hope to have the uh, completion of the enrollment uh, for this, uh, this year uh, to have 120 evaluable patients, and we expect to have the readout uh, sometime in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. And so hopefully, uh, or this would perhaps be the first uh, dendritic cell vaccine to be able to show uh, having a true uh, benefit for patients with glioblastoma. This is actually an MRI of a patient that was treated here at the University of Florida. You can see these arrows are pointing to uh, areas of white, uh, which are showing glioblastoma tumor that could not be taken out by surgery due to where this tumor was growing. This patient received standard treatment um, and started vaccination, and this shows his post fifth vaccine MRI, and I think you can appreciate there are absolutely no areas of white. And so this patient had a complete response to vaccine therapy, uh, or a combination, I would say, of vaccine therapy and, and treatment that has now been durable uh, for more than two and a half years. Uh, this is pretty remarkable for this disease um, and uh, uh, for a patient that couldn't undergo complete surgical resection to be disease-free two and a half years later uh, is, is, is quite striking. So we're hopeful uh, that the readout from the collective uh, treatment of these patients will also be One of the things that I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be speaking with uh, 27 heads of state. Uh, can somebody mute there? I, don't, I can't tell who that is, but if you can mute. Ah, I think I can mute him. Great. Um, so this shows, uh, this shows the uh, current immunotherapeutic treatments that are actually under evaluation here at the University of Florida. I won't have time to go through all of them, but the, uh, the lists in blue are ongoing clinical trials. The lists in the reddish color are actually clinical trials that will be opening this calendar year. And you can see we have cancer vaccines, adoptive T-cell therapies, and stem cell therapeutic approaches, as well as immune checkpoint inhibitors, all being investigated for patients with brain cancer uh, here at the University of Florida. So what does the future look like for our field? Um, one of the things that we're really focused on is trying to tailor the treatments to the right patients. We know that there are some powerful approaches. We have an incomplete understanding of who is likely to benefit the most, and a significant uh, amount of research is being uh, invested in having what we call precision cancer immunotherapy, getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. Also, we recognize that we probably have to combine approaches. And so in addition to knowing what is the most effective treatment approaches, we then need to personalize these combinations so that we have uh, the best and most potent safe combinations for a given patient. I'm gonna to touch on just a little bit of how we are doing that currently. This has been a project that's been under development for several years now at the University of Florida, taking advantage of our uh, Hypergator supercomputer, which many of you are aware is one of the uh, most powerful uh, supercomputers uh, at a university in the world. Uh, we're using the Hypergator to analyze the complex expression of all of the proteins in tumor cells, the various mutations, and comparing that profile to all of the known normal targets in the entire human genome to identify what is truly unique in a, in a given patient's cancer. So this is being done from their biopsy or from their own surgical resection to then get a unique profile for that patient 
And then we run it through algorithms that predict based on that patient's own immune system um, and the genes that underlie their immune system, what are they most likely going to respond against? And once we have that information, uh, we take the RNA and the DNA uh, out of the tumors to analyze all of that, uh, run these sequencing analyses, put it through this uh, hypergator supercomputer algorithm, and then come up with a patient-specific list of targets for vaccine formulation or for adoptive T-cell therapy. And then using uh, that information, we then create these dendritic cell vaccines and these activated ex vivo expanded T cells that have now been directed specifically against the targets that are expressed in their own cancer. We've developed ways of rapidly expanding these cells uh, in a clinical environment so that we can return these cells back to patients in um, this whole process within about six to eight weeks, uh, which is about the time that patients would undergo recovery from surgery and then standard treatments such as a radiation or a chemotherapy cycle. And so our goal is by, tw tw the, by the end of this year to be able to bring this therapeutic approach of precision adoptive cell therapy to patients with not just brain cancer, but other solid tumors as well. So in summary, uh, cancer immunotherapy is really a, has been and continues to be a paradigm shifting approach to treating advanced cancers. It's been shown to be feasible, to be tolerable and safe, uh, and to have promise in the treatment of patients with malignant brain tumors, in addition to its already de demonstrated benefits in patients with other cancers. Our future efforts, though, are really going to be on overcoming the resistance mechanisms that cancers have and developing personalized and precise combination treatments that are tailored specifically to a patient's own tumor. And so there are uh, a, a large number of collaborators. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the, of the brain tumor immunotherapy group here at the University of Florida. Uh, we also uh, collaborate with many investigators throughout the United States, North America, and now internationally as well. Um, the funding agencies that have supported this work are obviously critical. Uh, and most importantly, the patients and the families who really subject themselves to the clinical trials and, and really engender their trust in, uh, in the physicians and the scientists who are trying to uh, improve their care are obviously our uh, most ardent supporters. So I thank you for your attention. And I will stop my screen share. And I think we should have uh, hopefully a few minutes to for Q&A if there are questions. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions right away in chat. If you'd like me to read those to you or can you see them? Um, I, I can open them up here, so I can start. Uh, let's see, Larry has a question, says, how are CAR T cells introduced into the body at the site of the tumor or generally into the bloodstream? Yeah, great question. And the, uh, for the FDA approved indications for CAR T cell therapy, uh, which are against leukemias and lymphomas, those are administered intravenously. Um, and for solid tumors, it's being investigated um, about what we would call local regional delivery versus intravenous delivery as well. So in this specifically for brain cancer, um, lots of groups have been interested in whether or not delivering the T cells into either the resection cavity or directly into the tumor or into the CSF fluid might be uh, a more efficient way of getting these CAR T cells to the tumor than delivering them intravenously. Our group has actually uh, genetically engineered these CAR T cells to actually have homing receptors. Uh, Dr. Wong, who's an investigator here at the University of Florida, has developed uh, CAR T cells that actually home into the central nervous system or home to tumors, not just to brain cancers, by modifying them so that they actually have chemokine receptors that are attracted to the tumors. And so we are delivering them intravenously, but they have an enhanced ability to traffic into the brain. Uh, or the brain tumor site of growth. And so these are uh, actively being pursued depending on the type of cancers, but, the, but intravenous has been the most common delivery route for the approved indications. Um, please describe the nanoparticle approach. Ah, yes, yeah. so we, uh, our, our group, um, as I mentioned, or uh, showed on that screen, uh, we have a number of different platforms and approaches to uh, stimulating an immune response or enhancing immunity against brain cancers. Um, the nanoparticle approach that is uh, being spearheaded by Dr. Sayer, who's an investigator here at the University of Florida, is actually um, attempting to bypass the need to have cells, to harvest a patient's own cells to stimulate the immune response, but rather package the information for the vaccine 
into a nanoparticle that then is delivered to the patient and uh, can be taken up by their dendritic cells uh, in vivo. It's actually very similar uh, to the formulations that have been used for developing the COVID-19 uh, vaccines by Pfizer and Moderna. These are R what are called messenger RNA, uh, RNA nanoparticles where the RNA is packaged inside a nanoparticle and delivered to the host. Uh, uh, Dr. Sayer and, and our labs and, and colleagues have been collaborating on developing uh, these approaches for many years, and those will actually enter into clinical trials um, uh, shortly, in a few months, actually, in patients with brain cancer. Uh, let's see, what, stru what structure have you developed to have adequate patient numbers for your clinical trials? It's a really great question, and you know what? I, um, I had a slide in the slide deck that I took out that I, I kind of wish I had left in. It was, it was uh, directly addresses that question. So two things. Uh, what the slide showed was um, over the last five years, uh, where brain tumor patients uh, that have been treated at the University of Florida have actually come from. And it was a map of the United States showing that we've treated patients from over 43 different states that have traveled to Gainesville for treatment and enrollment on clinical trials, as well as three foreign countries. Um, and so we've become a destination center for specialized brain tumor care has been one way that we have, um, and many of those patients, although not all of them, but many of them are seeking out uh, the very specific clinical trials that are available for patients uh, with brain cancer at UF and are not available other places. Additionally, we've also worked very um, uh, ardently on collaboration with other centers. So we completed enrollment on the first trial where adoptive T cell therapy for pediatric brain tumor patients was developed here at the University of Florida but actually shipped out to other hospitals where those patients could be treated at their home institutions. So we collaborated with Children's Hospital Los Angeles and Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. We have an ongoing trial with University of Alabama Children's um, and others um, where we are using that same strategy. So we make their personalized treatment here in Gainesville, but we can actually uh, send those treatments to where they're where they being treated. Um, Dr. Yep. Mitchell, I actually have a question from our audience here at OCAMIC. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, wonderful uh, talk, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned several times things about vaccines, and I'm wondering if there's any thought or research being done on a vaccine that would be given to, say, patients who have genetic predispositions to a particular kind of cancer, whether there was you could be uh, treating them prior to any cancer showing up and hopefully stop them from showing up. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I heard the question and, and a really fantastic question. I can repeat just a portion of it if it make sure I understood it correctly, but the question of whether or not uh, there's work being done or, or attempts to think about vaccinating patients who maybe are predisposed to getting certain types of cancers or cancer syndromes in order to prevent the development of cancer and not just uh, the treat a cancer after it's developed. So, you know, that's, so the short answer is yes. There's some actually really innovative um, ideas about how to do that. You know, for, and that's been, for cancers that we know are associated with infections, that's obviously been very, very effective. HPV vaccine for cervical cancers, hepatitis vaccine for preventing liver cancers. So we know if you, if you know the target that's really associated with the development of a cancer and you can generate an effective immune response, you can prevent uh, the, those insults. The challenge for doing that with more, let's say cancers that are not associated with infections is knowing what those targets are and safely being able to boost immunity in a patient that would actually be prophylactic, that would prevent the development of the cancer. There's some proof of concepts in, um, in research that have shown that it is feasible if you, uh, and there's even some really innovative efforts to try to predict what those targets might be. Um, there's even some really neat strategies where because it's a somewhat hard to predict what those targets might be, it might be conceivable to induce immunity against targets that you can jet induce in cancers so that at a very early stage, you, would, you could actually, if a person was diagnosed with cancer, they would already have pre-existing immunity against some targets that could be induced. So there's a couple of different strategies in terms of truly trying to prevent the cancer or being able to treat it at a very, very early stage using the immune system that are actively being pursued. 
We don't have any of those strategies yet in clinical trials, but it's, uh, there's actually an ongoing study in dogs testing some of those concepts about preventing the onset of cancer using a cancer vaccine. It's a great question. Um, I have a question about the potential side effects. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Are side effects, the treatments appear to be very specific, but are there side effects to these immunotherapy treatments? Yes, so, so, so there, there have been, um, and, and importantly, the different uh, treatment approaches, as well as the cancers that are targeting, can have different side effect profiles. Um, the, probably the most widely understood and studied have been the ones that have come through the recent FDA approvals. So immune checkpoint inhibitors, as an example, as you can imagine, if you take the brakes off the immune system, Yes, you can get a very effective response against some cancers, but those breaks were there to prevent, uh, at least in part, to prevent you from having a harmful immune response against your own tissues. And in some patients, you can see uh, the development of actual autoimmune uh, toxicities or inflammatory toxicities where the immune response against normal tissues uh, actually uh, becomes problematic. Um, for, mo for the majority of patients, those are, can, um, can be identified and controlled, but in a small percentage of patients, they can, they can be very, very, very significant and even deadly. Um, and so for patients that are receiving those uh, types of treatments, they have to be watched and monitored very closely for any evidence of the emergence of these kind of side effects. Uh, CAR T cell therapies um, can also give a very potent immune response, but that potent immune response can lead to inflammatory toxicities that again, can be treated, and we even have drugs that are effective at blocking many of those. But again, patients have to be very closely monitored um, uh, for the emergence of those treatments and the early intervention to prevent them uh, from being uh, harmful. Otherwise, they can lead to, again, very significant side effects. And then cancer vaccines characteristically have been pretty well tolerated, but we haven't had as nearly as many cancer vaccines that have yet been as effective at eradicating cancers. So I think as, they, as these treatments get more potent, we are going to have to be on the alert for and probably have to deal with uh, more potent uh, potential side of immunologic side effects as well. Um, there's time for one quick question. You have a list of several cancers for which immunotherapies have been developed. What are the cancers that do not respond to yeah, great question. And so even, and I, and I think it's important to highlight that even with that list, uh, which is a growing list of cancers where immunotherapies have been approved, what we see in general is it's still roughly maybe a third or fewer of the patients, even with those cancers that have these very significant clinical responses. So even within the cancers, there are still uh, can be as up to two thirds of patients who don't derive benefits. So there's a lot of studies to still understand that. Some general characteristics are that the cancers that seem to have low mutations, so melanoma has a lot of mutations relative to other cancers. Lung can cancer has a lot of mutations relative to other cancers. And those tend to be the two cancers that have responded, generally speaking, the best to some of these immunotherapeutic treatments. And it probably has to do with the fact that there are more targets for the immune system to go after in those cancers than some of the others. Um, and so that's one general ca characteristic that seems to hold up. If you look at the mutations, as you get fewer and fewer mutations, you see fewer and fewer responses to immune therapy, but it's not the only underlying thing. And we're still trying to understand the, the, the differences both at the cellular and molecular level that really determine responsiveness. Uh, we do have one question, but unless it's a really quick one, I promise not to mention the people later, but it's going on, on a trend. So, Dale Williams, uh, do you have a quick question? It's not a quick question, actually. It is a comment. This was a phenomenal presentation, Dr. Mitchell. And it, from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like it's an exciting time to be in your field because there are seem to be a lot of progress that is going on. That, well, one, thank you. <laughs> I really greatly appreciate that uh, compliment. And it is, it is a really exciting time. Um, there's tremendous amount of work to be done. And obviously we want all patients uh, to, you know, I think the question earlier, we want to avoid the development of cancer. That is the goal we all are working towards. 
Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, but a lot of optimism about the future in terms of there being continued breakthroughs each year in this field. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, really enjoyed it. You made a complex uh, topic quite understandable. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation, and I hope you all have a uh, fantastic afternoon. And you too. Thank you. Good luck with your fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> See Take care. Bye -bye. Oh, my goodness.